Well, hello. This video, I'm going to dive into three heavy hitting concepts, white supremacy, white fragility, and white privilege. A lot to unpack there. Make sure you stay tuned for the rest of the video. So before we jump into our three concepts, it is imperative that I attempt to define racism. Can't really talk about those concepts without understanding racism overall. So racism itself is, is this belief that a particular race is fundamentally superior to all others. There's a prejudice there, right? But racism in its fullest context is that prejudice being added with power. It is these discriminatory actions that are being taken against the individuals that come from the group that you feel like is inferior, right? So racism is important to understand. It's not just the belief or the feeling, it's also the actions that are caused by those feelings. It's the acting on and actively trying to subjugate and oppress those that you feel are less worthy, deserving, physically, intellectually, morally, etc. So again, it's privilege put with power. In our society, that power lies within those systems. So the prejudice and the power come together in these systems that are created uh, from this, this, this prejudice belief system, right? So the healthcare industry riddled with health disparities that are rooted in racism, law enforcement, this conversation that, that has been happening um, over the past year and a half, and for a long, much longer than that, right? Around racist policing of communities. This perception that people of color are more likely to commit crime, more likely to be uh, violent, and therefore are over-policed or treated with a lack of real regard for safety, and presumption of innocence. Racism has never not existed in the United States. Just given the history of the country, there was never a time where there was an America that did not have racism. Western colonialism and the emergence of even in terminology like white and all of these racial categories that we think of today, which of course leads us into white supremacy. As you probably assumed, white supremacy is racism that is centered around the white identity. So white people that carry that identity are here and everyone else that doesn't have that identity falls beneath that. Because again, racism is this idea um, that there are groups that are superior and therefore groups that are inferior to that group. Um, and that is where that social status comes from. So a white supremacist society gives opportunities, gives considerations, gives protection to people carrying the white identity. Again, we're talking about social status here. Being included in that, in that particular category uh, becomes really critical. Whiteness is this catch-all term. Whiteness can represent people with German, Polish, Italian, uh, sometimes so many other heritage uh, and so many other lineages that get lumped into this phrase white or this category of white. Indigenous tribes and enslaved Africans um, were forced to take on these, these aspects and characteristics of whiteness, forced to assimilate, forced to take on um, what was deemed as being a civilized demeanor. All of that was through that lens of whiteness, right? We as white people who hold slaves and own slaves are deciding what is civilized and then we are impressing that onto these enslaved Africans. That carries over generationally. It doesn't just sort of stop. And also because of that history, so many rich and diverse cultures have been whitewashed. And that's where that term comes from, um, is taking that rich diversity and authenticity of a community, of a culture, and just completely painting over it uh, with, through, the, through the, the context of whiteness, because whiteness is seen as more appropriate. So let's, let's improve this, right? When we think about cultural appropriation, taking something from a culture and saying, you're gonna make it better. It, it was, nothing was wrong with it to begin with, right? Uh, that's just completely inappropriate. And it happens so much in the context of racial identity. 
uh, because oftentimes white people feel that they can come in and make things better for people of color. Like I'll help you, I'll fix you, I'll save you. That whole white savior mentality, that's where that comes from. Even individuals who carry other disadvantaged backgrounds still flock to and want to hold on to this association with whiteness because of the social power that it brings. So for example, poor white communities, right, have long had a history of really aligning their, their racial identity to try to exact uh, power and status over people of color when it was all about, you know, white men who owned land. For even for poor white men who did not own land, they they still relied on this idea that, well, I'm a white man though, right? I'm, I'm still better than this black man. I'm, I'm still not in the same category um, as these these other communities, right? I'm, I'm still associated with this identity that owes me and, and should have allowed me and afford me some privileges here. I'm distinguished from them. I may not have money, I may not have land, but I'm not, right? I'm, I'm still a white person and I'm still afforded these privileges and opportunities and respect more than anything. So within the context of a white supremacist society, white people, people with a white racial identity who are propped up above all other racial categories are then also given up privileges. So white privilege. Um, these are allowances, opportunities, protections, freedoms, um, comfort that other individuals are not able to um, take on, that are not afforded these same opportunities. And the only reason, the only reason, it's not merit-based, right? It's not, well, this person worked really hard, so they earned that. They earned that. No, no, no. We're talking about privileges that were not earned that are only given, only assigned, because you belong to that white racial category. It is completely not merit-based. We're not talking about working hard, um, being able to afford something, right? And that's a privilege. That's not what we're talking about. Privileges are things that you didn't earn. So for example, um, one of the privileges associated with the white racial identity is um, being a sympathetic victim being seen as um, someone who is the victim of something or, or a purported victim of something. Um, if you claim that something's happened to you, people believe you. People don't think that you're a liar, right? Many people of color really have a hard time with that because we're not afforded the same privilege to be believed. If I say something happened to me, oftentimes people will think I'm being dramatic or that I'm exaggerating right? Um, or I just, for some reason, don't seem like a victim. We see this a lot play out in these Karen videos, which everybody giggles at, but it's really not funny. This is These are real life situations that are happening to people every single day. And these are just the ones being caught on camera. These are not the only incidents. These are just the ones where somebody had the wherewithal to pull out a phone. It doesn't happen like that all the time. White women who in society are seen very much as sympathetic victims are lying about being harmed or threatened by people of color who are not seen as sympathetic victims. So again, when you bring into a system like law enforcement, okay, who a system within a white supremacist society who is influenced by those same principles um, arriving to the scene, who is gonna be believed here? The white woman or the black man? Just because you don't feel the privilege doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Exist. In fact, the, just the notion that if someone is talking about white privilege and you as a white person have no idea what they're talking about, that is indicative of your privilege because privilege protects. Privilege insulates. This whole idea of ignorance is bliss, the ignorance comes from the privilege. That's a privilege to be ignorant to something. It truly is. It's a privilege to learn about these concepts instead of having lived experience related to these concepts. That's a privilege. So even talking about the fact that you don't recognize your white privilege, that, that statement alone is proof of your white privilege. 
And then also, uh, oftentimes people feel like that because they've had challenges in their life, that means that they're they're not privileged. What do you mean? I've had it. I've had it difficult. I had difficult circumstances growing up. I went through trauma. I experienced poverty. No matter what that looks like, it is so critical to understand that white privilege does not mean that you as a white person have not experienced challenges in your life. That is not at all what this concept is focused on. It means that carrying that white privilege means that the challenges that you have faced in your life are not as a result of the fact that you are white. They have not been made worse by the fact that you are white. So many people said in 2020 that I'm learning and listening and I'm, I'm trying to be a more effective ally. I just have to pause because I mean, honestly, what did, what did you learn? What did you read? Everyone was reading. <laughs> Everyone was reading in 2020. Everyone was reading and researching. Everyone was trying to be a better effective ally. Um, and I just, I would really like you to submit a paper to me that explains what exactly it is that you were reading and learning because Oh, personally, I just haven't seen the fruits of that labor. I have not seen the fruits of that labor. So many white people talking about having these aha moments and just being so beside themselves and frustrated and enough is not hashtag enough is enough. Enough was enough for about 90 days, huh? Interesting. Oh my goodness. As soon as 2021 happened, as soon as 2021 started, Every time I was in a meeting with a prospective client or was in a stakeholder meeting, the conversation kept being, oh, you know, last year we had to have those difficult conversations. So I just want to put a pin in this and say, don't frame a conversation about race or racism that way. Don't say, oh, we had to have tough talks and difficult conversations. Don't frame it that way. It's so patronizing. Right? It really just sounds like a white person saying, um, uh, we had to talk about it. We had to go there. Like it was so uncomfortable for you. But again, that's a privilege. If all you have to do is sit and talk about it, if all you have to do is sit and go through a three hour training, one hour training, talking about race and racism in America, come on, that's a privilege, right? Whereas with people of color, we don't have the luxury, we don't have the privilege to just stop talking about it. If I decided today I didn't want to talk about my racial identity ever again, the world around me wouldn't even let me. The world around me wouldn't let me stop talking about it. Growing up with uh, white classmates, if ever one particular Wednesday I happened to forget I was a black girl, they were going to remind me. They were going to remind me. And I never could figure that out. Like, why do they keep bringing this up? I don't understand. Why do they keep bringing it up? Why do they keep bringing it up? I mean, of course I recognize it, you know, uh, but I just, I never understood why they kept talking about it. And I, in hindsight, being an adult now, I, I recognize that it was just so strange for them. They were not around people of color in their life in any other capacity. So when they came to school and saw little black Simone with this like hair that keeps changing, she had various amounts of oils on her skin all the time. It's just like, who is this person? I don't, I don't understand. Right. And no one was talking to them about diversity right, as a child. So you just have to recognize privilege and the role that it plays. If you don't recognize your privilege, you're not going to be able to be an effective ally. You're definitely not gonna be in the space of doing um, activism and being a co-conspirator or doing any form of anti-racism. Because again, it all starts with you. If you don't understand the identity that you carry and all of the associations that come with it, right? If you carry an identity um, that is not considered the norm in society and therefore doesn't have any of these privileges, you need to recognize that too. Because you need to understand if people are going to use that, right, um, to prevent giving you access to spaces 
or are going to expect for you, right, to cast that aside when you come into certain spaces. Anti-racism is individual and systemic efforts to directly and proactively, right, so not reactionary, but proactively disrupt and dismantle racism in all forms. They say, I don't, I think racism is bad and I don't believe in it. Yeah, I'm anti-racist. No, no, yeah. No. <laughs> no, no, unfortunately, that's that's actually not enough. That's, that's not how that works. Um, anti-racism is real strategic efforts being made while this sort of perspective of saying, well, I'm not racist, right? I don't behave racistly or believe racist things. That sort of attempt to remain neutral. Listen, we are in a space right now where neutrality has been taken off the table. It has been totally taken off the table. It's not even an answer choice. You don't get to select it because your silence is not neutral, right? Your inaction is not neutral. You trying to sit idly by while racism prevails is not a neutral act. You very much are propping up and supporting racism continuing around you with the people that you are in relationship with, right? Your friends, your family members, your partners that hold racist beliefs and you maintain relationships with them. I mean, got to ask yourself about that. Really have to ask yourself about that. How committed are you to addressing racism and you're maintaining relationships with racist people? White fragility is probably best summed up by thinking about it as gas, just straight up gaslighting. That happens when white people get uncomfortable um, because they have to either talk about race or racism, because they're confronted or caught out or called in about their own uh, behaviors and actions and perceptions. And it really is this, you know, sort of emotional, visceral response that happens. But it's important to think of white fragility in the context, again, of the privilege, right? Of white privilege that we just talked about, because the privilege, again, keeps you protected. It keeps you ignorant to things. So when things are brought to your attention or you find yourself in a space where you're forced to, to deal with something that you usually didn't have to deal with or you're used to sort of moving away from, you can get upset about that. It's like, wait, wait, I don't want, I don't want to talk about this, right? I don't, I don't want to have to deal with this right now. Specifically talking about um, incidences where a white person will start to cry in front of people of color when there's a conversation related to something um, that has to do with race or racism. As soon as that first tear falls, there is a power imbalance that is engaged because if that person of color, if those, if those individuals that are around them don't render them aid, don't comfort them, then they can automatically be seen as cold hearted, right? This person is weeping. You, you have to tell them it's okay. Don't cry. It's okay. But like, be clear about what's happening here. This is a white person who's shedding tears over racism in front of people of color. It's like, what makes you think you get to cry? Right? As the victim of the racism, if anybody's gonna cry, it's gonna be me. I get to cry first, right? I get to be the most upset. You don't get to have this emotional response that captivates the whole room, that that holds everybody in a space where now we, we have to focus on you and tend to you and sort of dummy down and shrink ourselves or our feelings or emotions. Or, the, or what we're trying to communicate because you can't handle it right now. And as soon as those tears start to flow, everyone else is like, oh, why don't we just change the subject? And this is too much. All because the white person started to cry. These aha moments where they realize the full scope of the history and the atrocities that occurred. And the fact that they carried this identity of the perpetrators of these offenses and um, this real, crimes against humanity that have happened over the years and that they continue to benefit from those crimes. 
and their responses was just weeping, openly crying. Oh, I can't believe this. This is so upsetting. But again, it's so upsetting to you, but you still get to walk out of this room and carry the privileges and benefits and opportunities and comforts that are associated with that identity that I don't have. This, this one moment was upsetting to you, but you're go you will go about your day. I am not afforded that opportunity. This is one incident for me, but I could go down the street and have something else happen to me and then go down the street from there and now it's something else and another conversation or another um, incident of harassment. So the biggest takeaway with white fragility is to understand that having an identity that is loaded with such privilege, you don't get the right to command the emotional space. Part of relinquishing that privilege is stepping aside and decentering yourself so that the emotions and the feelings and the trauma and the lived experiences of people of color take center stage. Your tears are so offensive to people of color. They are, they are just completely offensive to people of color. White guilt is not productive. What are you, what are you gonna just like sit in the corner and feel guilty forever, right? It's not productive. It's about taking this newfound information and knowledge and directly putting it to, to work. Making that decision about what are you going to do from this point? What are you willing to shift and change? When you talk about anti-racism, what are you willing to put into action? How are you going to use that power that was put behind a prejudice that led to your privilege, how are you going to use that to create some equity and to shift? I work with HR managers and executives and diversity officers. And many times in within the space of this work, they never have these conversations. They never specifically talk about these terms or say them out loud. They never say white supremacy. They never say white privilege. They never consider white, fr white fragility. And I'm just like, how are you doing this work without that? How could you possibly be doing diversity work and not talk about this? Like, I just don't understand how that happens. In addition to our training and consulting services, we have a wonderful online store that includes products that you will probably would find really helpful as well. One of those is icebreakers. Um, we have some really awesome icebreaker ideas, some questions and activities um, that you can uh, use in the professional setting or at home, right? Or in the community, no matter where you are. Um, but it can just help you start to have conversations around these elements of identity that you maybe aren't used to talking about and you're not sure how to get that going. So these icebreakers can be really helpful. We also have an amazing social justice glossary that I am just so, so, so proud of. Hundreds and hundreds of concepts and terms that are defined, the history, um, what communities they impact, just really amazing information in that social justice glossary. But just countless other products that we have on our website. So make sure you check it out at crawleycultural.com. If you found this video to be helpful, which I certainly hope that it was, make sure you give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Um, and we'll see you next time. Bye.